Well, good morning. It's good to be with all of you today. If uh, you're new or you're visiting, and this is your first or second, third time, whatever, my name's Dwayne. I'm one of the pastors here who serves under a head pastor, Jesus, and I'm the one that preaches most of the time here at The Resolved. And uh, I want to tell you that I- I'm glad you're here. I hope that you enjoy singing to our God with us, enjoy studying His Word along with us, getting to know others who are in pursuit of God as well. Uh, in my house this week, I've been having our girls memorize Matthew 6, It says, seek first the kingdom of God. And I'm teaching them to read their Bibles first thing in the morning, even though uh, they can't totally read yet and go look at the pictures before you do anything else. Uh, and one of the things we've been doing in the evening time is we've been talking about the, the meaning of this verse, to seek first the kingdom of God. And, and one of the things that's been uh, interesting in our discussion has been talking about what it means for us to seek God out, uh, what that means and what that looks like. Really, that's what we're, we're doing here each Sunday is seeking God. We're here to seek God. That's the, that's the purpose of worship. That's the purpose of a worship service that we should strive to be seeker sensitive, not dumbing anything down or, or watering it down, but striving to seek God to seek him. Uh, Today we're going to look at uh, a story about a group of people who gathered together in a city, but it wasn't to seek God. It was to seek their own glory, thinking that they they knew a better way, better path, better path of life where God was not at the center and the focal point of it. Uh, We're studying through the book of Genesis, just following each chapter and each story along one after another. And the one that we're looking at today is in Genesis chapter 11. And it's the story of Babel or Babel in in Hebrew. Uh, Once again, we'll see this week, as we've seen with previous weeks before, that the, the Genesis story or account is specifically or intently attacking other belief systems that were about at the time it was written in the ancient world. And it's proclaiming uniquely that God alone is the one true God who is alone worthy of worship. Uh, The false gospel, the story of Genesis 11 tackles is intellectualism in a sermon I'm calling none is wiser than God. So let's go ahead and read the text and I'll declare it as God's word and we can thank him for it all together by saying thanks be to God and then I'll pray over our time working through it. So this is Genesis chapter 11 beginning in verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as a people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people. And they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down. And there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. These are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Arpashad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Arpashad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arpashad had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah. And Arpashad had lived after he fathered Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. And Shelah lived after he fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And when Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Reu. And Peleg lived after he fathered Reu 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Reu had lived 32 years, he fathered Serug. And Reu lived after he fathered Serug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Serug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor. And Serug lived after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. And Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. 
Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, on the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren and had no child. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, I want to come before you this morning, before we really even start and get into this text and the sermon, this story, and just confess, God, I am a sinner. Uh, we, we are sinners. Uh, so often, so easily, our vision is not on you, Lord. So often we, we do live for the praise of other people. We need you. We need you to work in us. You've set things up and designed them that there's, there's something unique and special and extremely spiritual that can happen through a, a time like this where we gather together to sing praise and to study your word. Would you work in us in this way uh, during this time, God, not just to, not just to give us a, just some really insightful clues and tips into your word, not just more information and more understanding, we don't, we don't need more intellect, God. We need you to pierce our hearts with your supreme wisdom, the greatness of who you are, the graciousness of what you have done in your son, Jesus. So work in us in these moments, I pray, God. For Jesus' sake and his name, amen. Currently, the tallest building in the world is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, Stands 2,603 feet high, 163 floors. You can take an elevator all the way to the, the top. It's got all kinds of stuff in it. A pool at the 76th floor, an observation deck at the 124th floor. You can go to a nightclub at the 144th floor. Just amazing. I think there's another picture here of it in the just towers above the clouds, this massive building, both U.S. and world history has been enchanted with the feet of building tall buildings. There's currently 79 buildings in the world that stand over 1,000 feet tall. Since the late 1800s, countries have been building uh, skyscrapers out of steel. The uh, ancient world didn't have steel, but they likewise were infatuated with building large structures. They called them ziggurats. I think we've got a picture of a ziggurat for you here. Archaeological digs have discovered a bunch of these uh, old structures, something like 30 or more of them. They're a little bit different than pyramids. Pyramids were uh, hollow inside. Ziggurats were not. They're filled with, you know, mud and, and, and dirt. Uh, they, built, they were built with stone and brick for the sole purpose of creating a, a tower that would go up into the heavens so that the gods then could come down and, and eat and rest. Literally hundreds of stairs going up into the heavens. And at the top, there would be a little room and there would be a bed in there and an altar that they could offer sacrifices to the gods on. Repeatedly, we've seen since we started our study of the book of Genesis that uh, Genesis seemingly references these old ancient stories that were about in its day, but then retells them and correctively retells them in a different way with God as the only true God, not many gods, just one God, and God the only worthy God whom mankind is meant to worship. Seems that Genesis 11 and the story of Babel is no different. Uh, In the ancient Babylonian epic, Enuma Elish would have been around during the time Genesis was written. There's a story. There's a story about a bunch of gods who get in a fight with one another about who gets to create the universe. And so two gods, Marduk and Ea, they fight a couple other gods named Kingu and and Tiamat over this issue. Marduk and Ea win. And so when they win, Marduk uses the guts of of Tiamat to create the world and and the blood of Kingu to create man. To coronate the victory of the the gods who won, Marduk says to man, this is what he says in this ancient story and document, let mud bricks be molded and build high the shrine. 
Mankind does as instructed, and afterward the story says, they had built a high ziggurat for the Apsu. They founded a dwelling for Anu and Leel and Ea likewise. It's a story about a tower to the gods of the heavens by using mud bricks, just like we read about in Genesis 11. Genesis 11 seems to affirm that such a thing did in fact take place, but it has a very different twist on the story and what it was about and what's really going on. And that's what we want to spend the bulk of our time today looking at, to look at stairways to heaven and what they say about God, what they say about us and what we really need. I asked the band if we could sing one of the the greatest songs of all time this morning, Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven, but got shut down. They said it wasn't appropriate, but just so you know, that was the soundtrack for my sermon prep. It really helped prepare my heart for the, the text this morning. So, Stairway to Heaven. First main point, Stairways to Heaven, Pursuing One's Own Glory. Last week, we studied together the story of Noah and the Flood, and actually just sort of providential coincidence, I guess, but the trailer came out this week, so you should check it out. Uh, Pretty cool, didn't know they had that planned. But the story of Noah and the flood, it ended up with this long list of names at the end after the story, showing that how the, the human race was able to continue because of the art. Now, we didn't really deal with anything in particular with the names. But in the middle of it, there's actually this little important section in verses 8 and 9. And here's what it says. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on the earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Now, it's easy to miss at just kind of first glance, especially because it's in this long list of names, is that Nimrod's the ruler of Babel. Nimrod becomes a king, ruling over a kingdom, and Babel's the first city that he rules over. Thus, what we have in Genesis 11 is really this zeroing in on the story of what happened in Nimrod's city, Babel. That's why, you know, if you're reading carefully, you see a couple times in in Genesis chapter 10 that it it references that there's already multiple languages and people are already dispersed over the, the face of the earth. That's because everything after verse 10 in chapter 10 happened at after the story of the Tower of Babel, which we read about in Genesis 11. Though Genesis 11 doesn't mention Nimrod by name, what we what we find and what we we read in the story today is that his city was evil, um, a family line of blessing which we find at the end of our chapter this morning, it does not flow through Nimrod's line, but rather his uncle Shem's line instead. This leads many to think that the the text in chapter 10 is talking about Nimrod being a hunter before the Lord, that it's not really talking about him being a a hunter of animals that, that found favor in God's sight, that he's not a guy that God really likes or approves of. Instead, Nimrod's one who goes after men to build cities for his own glory, the glory of his own kingdom, thus he's a hunter of men in defiance to the Lord, right up in front of or before the Lord. Nimrod succeeds in being the first people, first person to gather together people for the sake of an ungodly kingdom that sits under his own rule and might. Now look at verse 4 of chapter 11 with me. I want us to, to focus on and hang out on this verse for a little bit. Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Let's make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. First, we need to recognize that the desire to build a city was not a bad desire. That wasn't a bad thing. As we saw earlier in Genesis, the call of mankind to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth and to work the ground and to, to keep it was a call to cultivate the earth's resources in such a way that a lot of people could live together with God walking in the midst of them. It was the call of God for them to build a God-glorifying city. Cain's the first one in the Bible who we read about attempting to build a city, but he does so really in rebellion against God, who in judgment had told him he was to be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Nimrod here, he comes along, and what's his motive in building a city? To make a name for themselves. To make a name for themselves. The line, a tower with its top in the heavens, tells us what kind of name they were wanting to make. One that was well known for its ziggurat. 
one that was well known for its ziggurat. You see, it wasn't so much about the, the height of the tower, like they were trying to build some skyscraper or something like that. With its top in, a, in the heavens, it tells us that this is a religious thing. This is, this is uh, referring to the gods of the heavens. In fact, the original meaning of the word Babel meant gateway to the heavens. And the, the idea there is that the gods of the heavens could, could come down to the ziggurat stairway and they could traverse between their world and the human world. Ziggurats were for the worship of false gods. So Babel really is a, re- a rejection of the Lord God as God. It's a rejection of him in exchange for the worship of other gods. And the goal or the desire with Babel is not to make God look great, but for the people of Babel to look great. They want renown, acclaim, glory. That's what we have here is simply another expression, an example of the same scenario of Eden just playing itself out once more. As Adam and Eve reached out in the garden after the forbidden fruit and desire to become wise, so the people of Babel reach up to pursue their own glory and the folly of their wisdom. I want to hang out here on on this for a minute because the way that the Bible here seemingly reads is it just puts a ton of sort of weight on this phrase. Let us make a name for ourselves. Let's make a name for ourselves. God's name is to be great. But there's almost this universal thing inside of, of us as human beings that desires for our name to be great. For us to be great plays out in all kinds of different ways. Consider a few different types of people. There's the the businessman whose sole goal is to build a successful company or to, to rise up in the company that he works in, his hopes to make a lot of money and that his name will be revered by by others. Just have a better and better looking resume. That he becomes a, a commodity that's coveted by others, and this drives him. He may or may not have a family, but if he does, he, he sacrifices them on the altar of the pursuit of his name. There's the musician or the actor whose desire is to get a, a record deal or to get a role on TV or, or a movie, and they're just, they're just hoping for and longing for people to know their name, to become a star. There's the college student who is bought into the message that they can be or become whatever they dream, whatever they want to be, and so they can't wait to make a name for themselves in the world. There's actually an article that came out recently in one of the well-known business journals that said that college graduates now, they they want the top-level positions, and they they don't have any patience to work for them or to um, rise up into them. They want a name. Then there's the college grad who who graduates and he gets a decent job, but he doesn't have a family, and so he spends all of his or her money on whatever they want all the time, just going out all the time, and love being invited to things and that people know their name, and they're included. There's the mom who carefully crafts an image of herself to to other moms so that she never shows any signs of weakness or any struggle because... If they knew her loneliness or her frustration, they wouldn't think that her name is very great. So this desire for our name to be great, it sits beneath the surface in each one of us, and it, it sneaks in to our thoughts and to our motives, our actions, the pursuit of our lives. I met with one of the guys in our leadership development program recently, and there was just this sort of sweet moment of honesty and humility in the conversation that we were having. And and he he just said, you know, Dwayne, I have to confess, I've wanted to be a leader in the church for a long time because I want other people to think that I'm smart and that I'm spiritual. I, I want other people to look up to me and I know it's sin. What do I do? What do I do? Here's a, my confession church. It's in me too. I have the same problem. By God's grace, we were able to start this church from 
scratch with a handful of people in our living room coming up on nine years ago. And as we've grown with more and more numbers and more and more ministries, more and more community groups and more services, it's easy for me to start taking credit for it, to start to think that it's because of my leadership or because of my preaching or you know, and I start getting invited to speak at other churches or, or conferences or when the Acts 29 network that we're part of asked me to be the overseer of the churches in our region last year. The truth is, I like it. The dirty secret is I like it and I want more of it. You know, we're in the final stages of editing the, my first book and there's thoughts that come into my mind just wondering, oh, I wonder how many people are going to gonna read this and uh, buy it and I wonder if more, how many people are just more and more are going to hear about who I am. And maybe I'll get more invitations to speak at more conferences or more churches or bigger platforms. And, and I get lost down this sinful, evil desire of thinking about making a bigger name for myself. The pursuit of my own glory rather than God's. It's ugly. It's It's sinful. It's something that God has to change and, and deal with in us. See, we all attempt to make our own stairways into heaven. What's yours? How is your life more about the pursuit of your own name than God's? How has this sneaky, sinful, wretched longing worked its way into you and who you are? I mean, we've got to be able to see this. You've got to get honest with yourself and where you're, you're really at and who you really are because if you don't see it, then you can't even come to a place where then God can begin to work in you and change you. We'll get to how God changes us in a few minutes, but first we need to see what God thinks about us. When we're stuck looking at ourselves, looking down internally, the first step is to look up and to look at God. So let's, let's do that. Move on to our second main point. Stairways will be judged. God's jealousy for his glory. Let's get back to the story. There's some funny irony and wordplay stuff going on here. The people of Babel are saying, come, let's build, let's make a name for ourselves. And what's God's response? Verse 5, the Lord came down. And then again, verse 7 says, he says either the angels or to the other members of the Trinity, come, let us go down. And there's something kind of, comical about all this that's going on. Uh, I mean, you've got to kind of get, get the picture in your mind. Babel's building this building, this tower with its top in the heavens, and it's got this stairway that's reaching up to supposedly to the gods. But God, the Lord, the one true God, he's, he can barely even see it. <laughs> he's so great, he has to come down off his high and and holy throne to see what Babel's doing because he just, he can barely even see it. Barely invisible to his eye. Any of you been on a plane recently? Or sit by the window and you're like looking out the window and you can see a big building and it's so big when you're sitting there on the ground, but as the plane takes off and gains more and more altitude, what happens? The building gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it's just a speck of dust, and you can barely even see it. That's the, that's the picture here. The tower is great in their eyes, reaches to the heavens, but God can barely even see it. Barely even visible because he is so much greater than they realize. Babel builds this monument to connect with false gods. Then surprise... The true God actually comes down. So what happens when God comes down? Look at verse 6. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing they propose to do now will be impossible for them. God comes down, and he sees what they're doing, and he's grieved deeply. This statement just reads in in agony. This is only the beginning of what they're going to do. He's pained. Uh, don't misunderstand what's, what's being said here by God. I mean, he's, he's not threatened by Babel. I mean, God's not afraid of them becoming, oh, no, they're getting too powerful. They're going to become more powerful than me. No, he's not afraid of what they'll be able to do after they complete the tower. God's grieved at how they perceive themselves. 
God recognizes that they're going to fall further and further into the delusion of thinking that they are something great. He sees the future. At the, the cities, the cities which are meant to be for families and commerce and the enrichment of the land will become places for crime, congestion, corruption, because they're not built for the glory of His name. So what does God do? He confuses the languages, the language which causes them to give up on the building project, and then everyone moves away to different places. Now, a couple things here. There's two main theories out there about the origin of language. Uh, one of them is monogenesis, which uh, thinks that all languages originated from one language, and the other is polygenesis. It says there's several different sources for all the different languages um, that are about. Now, there's a couple documents which date back to Babel's time, which speak about a united race who all spoke one language. So um, many people look at the story of Babel as evidence supporting the one language theory. But here's the problem. The way that the one language theory works is that there's, there's one language, but slowly, gradually, over a lot of time, bit by bit, the language changes and expands, and so you end up with a lot of different languages after a very long period of time. What we have with the story of Babel is something far different. This is a supernatural intervention by God to disrupt the plans and the purposes of Babel. The Hebrew word for confusion actually sounds like Babel. It's uh, onomatopoetic, if anybody remember that fancy word from eighth grade, onomatopoeia. Uh, it, it sounds like what it is. Babel's just a blubbering mess, like, you know, baby, I've got an 11th month old, and, you know, her words are just ba ba, mama, na na, all this, you know, Babel. Uh, as I think what we have here with God's judgment, it's not. It's not God just kind of instantaneously making up all these different languages that he gives them to the, to the people, and now they can't communicate with one another. It's something more than that. He brought confusion. If you think about it, I mean, they, they probably could have kept up the building project and uh, finished it off and lived in the same place as the pig and people and worked out their language issues. That was probably doable. I mean, have you ever met somebody that doesn't speak your own language? Uh, what do you do when you're having trouble communicating? You like start pointing and motioning and doing weird things with your body to try and communicate. Um, they could have they done that. What happens with Babel is more than just God making it hard for people to communicate. This is a judgment act of God to break up the unity of the people that's surrounded, upon, surrounded on the idea of worshiping false gods. He came to break that up. God's goal wasn't just to stop people from building towers. I mean, several more towers were built after that and continue to be built. What's unique about Babel is that it's this one-time demonstration from God where he himself comes down to express his displeasure at those who pursue their own glory. So he does something to make that difficult for them. God brings confusion to speech and through it disperses the people so that Forever, for all, all time, we might know and hear this story about the danger of not living for God's glory. It's interesting how in many ways we still feel the effects of Babel. Not only when you're trying to communicate with somebody who speaks a different language than you, but how often the pursuit of our own glory ends up in skewed speech. Here's what I mean. You ever noticed how easy it's a, it is to be misunderstood by someone? Ever noticed how hurtful your words can be to other people? What you say and how you say them. Ever noticed how our speech is one of the main ways that we use to promote our own glory? Whether it's something you say verbally or something you put in writing. Hmm. Whether it's verbal or written, we use words to promote ourselves. I mean, make no mistake, this is a this is a key issue for God, his, his own glory. God is extremely jealous for his own glory. So here's a key, very clear verse for us on this. Isaiah 48, 11. Here's what it says. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. How should my name be profaned? I will not give my glory to another. I will not give my glory to another. Theologically, we, we recognize at the beginning of our study of the book of Genesis that it's, it's right for God to seek his own glory. 
simply because he's that great. I mean, what makes the pursuit of your own fame, your own name, what makes that unbecoming is the reality that you really are not that great. If anybody actually got to know you, they would see that and discover that. But if you are, in fact, the one and only, most supreme, most wise, most powerful, most holy being in all of existence for all of eternity, you are that great. Then it's the most right thing in the universe for you to seek your own glory and call others to worship you. To, to, not, to not do so would be wrong. You see, the reason God cannot give his glory to another is that if he did that, that would be a lie. It would not be true. None is as glorious as he is. God is about his glory, and rightly so. He, he wants his name to be revered. God wants to be worshipped. He ought to be worshipped. He will not share his glory with another. Earlier, I told you a bit about some of the issues in my heart that God's had to address. Um, when I remember when we first started the church for the first two years, you know, things were really slow going. A lot of kind of problems and issues we had to face weren't going that fast, and I was just I was really frustrated, um, frustrated because I felt like I was doing everything right and God wasn't doing what He was supposed to do, and it wasn't happening. And so, um, I mean, I. Thought I was a good leader, I was preaching good sermons, thought our music was good, but it just wasn't happening. Uh, church didn't seem to be growing. I remember hitting a really, really low point, and I just felt like thrown in the towel, saying, you know, forget this church plant, forget pastoring, and, and I was praying about it, probably more like yelling at God um, about what I was supposed to do. And I remember sitting and, and thinking and praying, and this verse came to my mind, Isaiah forty eight eleven. My glory I will not give to another. And I remember praying, and it was, it was almost like there was this question from God to me. Dwayne, is this about you, or is this about me? Is this about your glory or mine? What's the church going to be about? And I began to recognize the sick twistedness of my soul that had just been seeking to build a church for my own name rather than God's. And I walked away from that, that season of life with a new lesson just ground into my heart that God is really, really jealous for his own glory. He will not give it to another. He's a jealous God. You see, when we try to build stairways to heaven, not only do they not work, but what needs to happen is they need to be smashed. When we find stairways... Pursuing our own glory in our hearts, we must abandon them. Let the towers come crashing down. If we don't, there's judgment. This is what Jesus says, Matthew 12, 36. He says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every idle word. Every babble word. Every babble word we speak will be judged by God. What God does to, to babble is really a small picture of the greater day of judgment that Jesus speaks of be much worse. I mean, do you guys get this? You get what I'm getting at? God rightly seeks his own glory. Rightly so. He should because God's truly the most glorious in every regard. We are not. If if we don't recognize that and we don't seek to spread the fame of his name, then what we'll end up doing is building babbles. Build babbles in our hearts and God will not let us get away with it. There'll be a day of judgment. I mean, this is, it's a problem, isn't it? But the, the story of Babel in Genesis 11, it doesn't end with judgment. Perhaps surprisingly. It actually ends after the people are dispersed. It actually ends in, in hope because we have another genealogy, another list of names, don't we? And every time in the Bible you get a genealogy of a bunch of a list of names, it's because its main purpose is to remind us of the promise that goes all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden, that there is one who has a name that is above every name who will come. He will come and he will save. Save people with babel tongues and babel hearts. So let's move on and talk about the one with this name name of Jesus, 
our last point for this morning, stairway is not needed. Jesus brings heaven to us. In some ways, the Tower of Babel is just a, it's a symbol for the height of our, our sin problem and, and how we try to earn our way to God with our own self-centered works, making our personal stairways to heaven. We've seen how the strong and yet subtle desires in our hearts, they, they, they rise in us and make us want to have a name for ourselves. We've seen how God's rightly jealous for the fame of his name and will judge those who seek their own glory instead of his. Yet, God is not a God of judgment only. See, if it were only the greatness of his justice and his holiness and his power that made him glorious, that would be enough for everyone to recognize that and and worship him and him be worthy of that and him to command everyone to worship him for how glorious he truly is. That would be enough in and of itself. But in addition to all of his proper attributes, God is also a gracious God who loves his people and has mercy on them. The fact that in the story of Babel that God even comes down, it's a sign of his graciousness. God would have been just fully within his rights to just obliterate the city and just wipe it out instantaneously for such blatant disregard of his name. But here he comes down, puts humanity in check, gives them the opportunity to live another day, to seek him and live for his glory. The story of Babel, we see that God is a God who comes down. One day, many years later, God came down again. And this coming, he didn't come down to judge, but came to save. How? He comes down in Jesus, and he takes on human flesh. He becomes a man, and then he lives the perfect example of what it looks like to be a person who lives for God's glory alone all of his days. And then he takes on sin and the judgment of God onto himself on a cross to pay the price for all who have sought their own glory instead of God's. That God would come down in this way to such a small, insignificant, sinful human beings. It just, it, it breaks every category. Intellectualism does not get you this. This does not seem Wisdom. Here's how one of the books written after Jesus came describes it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 through 21 and verse 24. It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discerning, discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater or the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world for since in the wisdom of the world... The wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Christ, Jesus Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. We live in a a day where intellectualism rules the land. Philosophers call it humanism. It's where the, the merits of human Reasoning are either elevated above or at the expense of faith in God. Faith is seen as subject to reason. That believing there is a God is not a sure thing. We think we're smart. Think that we can solve problems. We just do the right thing as we continue to argue about health care and we war with other nations and try at treaties and all these things. We think we can figure things out. We think that we know better when it comes to God and that we can do without him. We think, think we know better when it comes to God, marriage, sexuality, work, play. But we don't. We're foolish. We're lost in the delusion that we are something great. 
that God has grace. He sent Jesus. Jesus comes down to save. Save us from ourselves and the consequences of our sin. In Jesus, God breaks all the categories. You see, in Jesus, we, we see God as utterly glorious because of the grace that he extends to sinners like you and I. He's glorious beyond glory. In Jesus, we see that we could never do enough to make it to God. So he comes to us. Baba wanted a name for itself. <laughs> In Jesus, God shows us why his name is better. Babel speaks words of confusion. Jesus speaks words of life. Babel results in people's lives being torn apart and scattered. Jesus brings us together, makes us whole, brings us to one another, and we gather together for the praise of his name. And then he sends us on mission to tell other people about his name, to see that life is better when it's not about the pursuit of your own name. When you're really being a steward of the gifts that God has given you in order that you might point to him and show off that he is so great. After Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he went about showing himself for a period of 40 days. And after that, the uh, Bible says he ascended on a cloud, vowing to return again on a day. There will be judgment for some and a reward of heaven for others. Shortly after he ascended to his heavenly throne, the church was born. And, and when it was, something interesting took place. It was on a religious holiday back then that they called Pentecost. And on this particular Pentecost, there were people visiting the city of Jerusalem from all kinds of different places over the world, and they all spoke different languages. And on this first day of the church, on Pentecost Sunday, Peter, one of the original disciples, he stands up to preach a sermon about Jesus, and something miraculous happened, and that everybody heard him speaking in their own language. Heard him preaching in their own native tongue. It was a picture of the unity the gospel brings. The good news of, of Jesus is, and what he has done, it just it crosses all racial, cultural, and linguistic boundaries. It, it just breaks all categories. The gospel is universal in its power and its scope. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've been through in your life. The gospel is for you. It breaks all categories. The story of Babel, it finds its ultimate conclusion in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, which describes and predicts the day of Jesus' return. It's an amazing picture. People are gathered together from everywhere. There's people of all kinds of tribes and all kinds of tongues. They, they come and they are, they're united together and Jesus returns. But when, when he returns, he doesn't return empty-handed. He brings a whole city with him. Check it out. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1, 2, and 3. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as they are God. <laughs> Man can never build a city up to God. So God builds his own city, brings it with him, brings it to man. He might be our God, and we might be his people. No stairways needed. Because God's truly the one who comes to us. Our sin is high. But the depth of God's grace is greater. It's greater. I want to conclude and prepare us to respond to the gospel and the preaching of God's word as the band comes up to lead us in a couple more songs. Ask yourself in these moments, where am I today? Where am I? I mean, maybe you've been realizing the stairways that you've built are ugly. You've been pursuing your own glory, trying to make a name for yourself. No, it just it needs to stop. It's, it's towers in your hearts. They got to come down. I've been praying for us 
this morning praying for many of you um, that our view of God would change this morning. I mean, first off, if you're, if you're not a Christian, my prayer is that you would see that life pursuing your own name and your own fame is empty and that you need God. For many others, a lot of you are Christians, but you very well may be living in a very man-centered view of your life today. I think everything is about you and what you're doing and where you're going. And, and my prayer is that the way that you look at God would change. That, that he would make us a people who are far more focused on his glory than our own. That it would not be about us, but about him. That he would increase and that we would decrease. Um, God is glorious in every way. Babel came together seeking their own glory. We want to come together to seek the glory of Jesus. Each week we respond to the gospel by coming to the table of our Lord, the elements of the bread and the wine, the the bread, Jesus' perfect life, living for the glory of God and his painful, bloody death offered on the cross to pay the price for the pursuit of our own glory. Proverbs 3, 7 says this, says, Be not wise in your own eyes, Fear the Lord, turn away from evil. Let's turn away from evil and turn to the glorious one today, to turn to Jesus. Only he's wise, good, fair, and true. Only he's glorious. Because of who Jesus is and what he has done, this is what the book of Philippians says in chapter 2, verses 9, 10, and 11. It says that God has bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee but bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, he came to change, he came to change our babble to bowing. We bow before him and we would speak his praise. He came down to us so that we could come to him. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, God, we come to you through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the only name given under heaven where any man must be saved. God, would you work in us in these moments? Change us. Take out us. Let our lives be about you. Thank you, God, that you are not just a God of justice and judgment, that you are also a God of grace, and that you sent your Son to change our Babel tongues and our Babel hearts, that we might bow and live lives that are about you. Work in us in these moments as we respond to your word. In Jesus' good name, amen.